What up, what up, what's happening? Today is May the 14th, 2021, and I am your host, Deontay Curl, host of this wonderful podcast, Turn Up the Volume Podcast. Just don't laugh at me. I know you're laughing because you be getting the kick out of this stuff. But listen, I'm excited because today is a very special day. I'm excited because today we're celebrating 20 episodes of Turn Up the Volume, 20 episodes of turn up the, yeah go ahead clap yeah go ahead clap we, we 20 episodes in listen you could not have told me uh 20 episodes ago back in january when i launched this podcast where we would be where i would be how long i would be doing this what things would look like you know different things about the podcast like i was telling jess before um we went live i was telling her that i've literally seen my office transform i've seen new equipment come in i've seen just the the way that i do my show if you really look at my show if you go back the last 20 episodes you'll see how from the first episode up until episode 20 which is today um the software how i use the, the software is different like i make it you know nice so it's enjoyable when you're looking at it you know to see the lower thirds and all the other kind of stuff like i really 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 take that time out to uh, make sure when I'm before my people live that I'm giving y'all some quality stuff to look at. And so um, today is like no other. And so I celebrate 20 episodes. So, of course, officially, I told I told I was telling just this earlier. I said, listen, every every 20 episodes, I'm going to do it. I'm going to break it down into seasons. So we have officially finished season one of Turn Up the Volume podcast. I don't know why I felt like <laughs> I don't know why I felt like an exec. In some in some big old uh, newsroom saying, "Hey, we just did a whole season." So I'm just saying, and that's what you call black entrepreneurship. You can call your own shots and do what you want to do. That's black power when you can say when you can break down what you want and say what you want to do, and say, "Look, this is a whole season and it's in the books." Like so, after this, we start season two of Turn Up the Volume podcast. But without further ado, I'm gonna just go ahead because she's been waiting in the queue and she got her blink her her blinkish headphones. And so, uh, none other than Jessica Mitchell. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, she just got ordained, so we're going we gonna, to we gonna clap it up for her because she just got ordained itinerary elder in the AME Church. Uh, congratulations to you, uh, Rev. Reverend Jess. How you feeling? I'm feeling good. How are you? I'm doing, I'm, I'm doing good. Congratulations to you. You just you were ordained. Make sure I say it right. You were licensed and ordained, and you were ordained. I want to make sure ordained itinerant elder in the AME church so you traveled all the way to georgia uh to participate in that and i think it was like a long week thing that y'all had to do in georgia i, I did try to watch some of it you said what our annual conference was two days so yeah oh this listen listen it's black folks it's shorter now because of the pandemic so we give god thanks listen i was about to say because you know black folks we love we love them long them week-long revivals boy and them week-long meetings but yes. we love it we love it. But the pandemic has cut a lot of our services and a lot of things we do short. Um, but if you really look at the country, the world is opening back up as we know it. Mm-hmm. You know, and so I'm a little fearful for them folk that ain't got nothing to do with their lives. They're going to make stuff longer again, you know. But that's, <laughs> that's neither here or there. And listen, that's neither here or there. But like I said, congratulations to you. And uh, I was, listen... Jess, this has been the third episode that Jess has been on with me. All right. Mm -hmm. And so out of all of my guests, she has been on the most. And I think that's really important because the subjects that we talk about, and I thought this was very important. Tonight we're talking about uh, post-traumatic stress or PTSD. And I thought it's very important because the last time you were on, we were talking about Jesus and therapy. And um, I thought about the plight that African Americans are in in terms of police brutality and you know the the social unrest that we're going through and I thought about just everything that we have gone through as a community not just over the last decade or the last 20 years or even since the beginning of this country or the legal inception of this country but I've I've thought about what we've been through as a people and you know, seeing certain things, being victims of certain things like lynchings, murders, beatings, and and all this other kind of stuff like that brings on stress or you know or post traumatic stress for a lot of people, and oftentimes 
I look at people and I look at our race and I look at our, our community. We're in a plight for progress. We're trying to do different things, get legislation changed and, and, and wonderful things like that. But um, sometimes we can be in a better state if we make sure along the way we're checking our mental state along the way. So, so what I mean by that is while we're trying to get progress, while we're trying to get legislation changed, we at the same time have to deal with what happened to us and what we experience as a people, right? Because, you know, it's, it's, it's not every day where a lot of people go to therapy and, and, and people deal with the grief or they deal with the loss or they deal with the post-traumatic stress. And sometimes people don't even know they're, they're wrestling with PTSD, but they're still functioning, you know, and still trying to figure out certain things about themselves while they're going along. And so this is why we got this platform to where we can talk about this stuff to where as we're progressing and as we're trying to get legislation changed in Congress and do different things and not just, you know, on, on that national level of, of racial unrest, but also the everyday things that people go through in general, you know, because sometimes we have the everyday experiences that have nothing to do with race that cause us to have PTSD. So we're going to break all of that down tonight. And we got, I call it the good doctor. We got the good doctor on here tonight that's going to help us out and talk with us a lot about that, a lot about that stuff. So before we get started, do me a favor. Share this broadcast. It's on Facebook now. We Facebook Live, but I post all of my episodes on YouTube. So right now, I want you to hit that share button. Maybe tag five people in this video so we can get this thing out there uh, because we got the good doctor here. And so, just before we get started, listen, I, of course, you know me, I like to do my homework. <laughs> you shaking your head at me. <laughs> I like to do my homework, and uh, I saw some stuff So um, about PTSD. About seven or eight of every 100 people will have PTSD at some point in their life. And about eight million adults have PTSD during a given year. And I got this on the PTSDveteranaffairs.org website. That's, the numbers are crazy, right? Um, so first, so first, break down to us the terminology. What exactly is PTSD? How do we define it? Yeah, so first I want to say congratulations on 20 episodes. Yes. Woo! You're doing great work. Don't make me shout. You know, I shout in the heartbeat. Don't make me shout. I know, you did I got, I, I, got, I got one in the got pocket. It. I swear to God, I got one in the pocket. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always ready. Over my head, I hear music. Look, I'm, Go I'm, ahead and give God a good one. When you ready. You bet, you bet. Black folk, black folk, we work good when we sneak up on you, when we sneak and dance up boy, you can't, look, you got, you haven't, you haven't been to church and you just, and, and everything going good and it's quiet, somebody just get up and just, they'll, they'll be the best ones, I tell you, I tell you, but go ahead, <laughs> they'll be the best one, but go ahead, break down PTSD, what is that for us? Yes, so PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, is uh -huh. defined as events such as a car accident or any type of major accident that can happen in your life, mm -hmm. you can go through an assault, whether it's physical assault, sexual assault, domestic um, violence, military combat, a natural disaster, a pandemic as we are mm -hmm. in. Oh, you know what? Yeah, I didn't think about that. Yeah. And so with PC, when you encounter a traumatic event, it has lasting effects on you. On your mental, it has lasting effects on your emotional health and well-being. Mm -hmm. So you brought up a great point because you brought up a pandemic. A pandemic can be... Uh, once a, in a century. Once, once in a century, right? And so even when this is... All, like, as we're trying... I think our country, we're trying to phase out of being in a pandemic, you know, because they're... They're doing certain things like if you've been fully vaccinated, you can stop wearing your mask here and there, what have you. I'm um, still wearing my mask though. Listen, listen, listen. I don't care what nobody say. All right, we uh, people are getting vaccinated slowly but surely. Okay, so protect yourself. And see, people fight about this all the time. Like you know what they make it political about wearing masks. Well, I mean, you gotta wear a seatbelt when you're in your car. All right, and so if you don't wear it, you know you play you stupid games. You play stupid games, you get stupid prizes, right? And so until we can get to a place of herd immunity, listen, protect yourself. Okay. And that's Deontay Kerr with your small with your uh 
a powerful small mm-hmm. moment, your Bishop T.D. Jakes moment. All right. But uh, so a pandemic can be. And, and so let's talk about that for a second. So as we so what, what kind of things when you talk about a pandemic and PTSD, like how, how does that go hand in hand? What does that look like? I guess. I mean, right now for us. Back in 2020, it's mm-hmm. been a whole year. Yeah. Um, the amount of people who have passed away, right? It was just happening so ra- so rapidly, so quickly, yeah. where people weren't even able to catch their breath, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's just like, this person died, not giving yourself even the opportunity to even process, yeah. oh, I just lost my mother, I just lost my father, or I lost a friend, an uncle, mm-hmm. I mean, a coworker unexpectedly yeah yeah and and, you know it's crazy because when i think about i feel like as you talk about it and as you make me aware of it i feel like i've been dealing with some ptsd uh, with covid because i have gone through so many changes this last year with covid alone not just changing life as i know it or a life as we all know it um even when it comes to co-parenting, like, cause I have small children that I co-parent with, you know, and, and dealing with things in that aspect with two different households, two different households going through, doing two different things and trying to be on the same page and, and like things like I'm not, my church has been shut down for, for this entire pandemic. Like I remember the last service we had prior to everything officially being shut down and we have not opened since. A lot of other churches have, but part of the reason as to why we haven't opened is because majority of our members are senior citizens who are high risk for COVID, you know, and we have lost one too many members. I'm not talking about just one or two, but we lost several of our members due to COVID, you know, and a great deal of them have been there since I was an infant, right, since I was born. And so... I've been dealing with that internally. Only person that knows about that is my wife. Like certain people that I, when we do open up, I won't ever see them again. And so that's that's a lot even for me, you know, just growing up there as a child. And so, um, you know, you just, in some instances, it's like you just don't know what the other side is going to be. And so just every day you wake up is a constant reminder for me about COVID. So, yeah, I feel like I've been dealing with uh, PTSD with that man that's some that's some real stuff yeah I mean no one really talks about how you are to even process the things that you're going through mm-hmm. right you know yes our last episode was therapy Jesus in therapy <laughs> you know um, but sometimes it's even how do you even get to that place to finding the therapist and we I know we discussed that the last time we we Uh, we're talking and Mm -hmm. when it pertains to this particular pandemic especially for pastors and other clergy or ministers um, healthcare workers essential workers like the amount of death that they have Mm. had to deal with Mm. have they been able to even take the time out to process right Mm -hmm. like have they even been able to have the time to just t- catch their breath, right? Yeah. So for my church here in New York, um, I was about 17 people passed from COVID. Oh my God. 17. It's like death after death after death after death, right? Mm. And so it's just like, well, who's there to support the pastor, right? Who's there to support the ministers who are experiencing the loss of now their church member and that this member has been there, what, 5, 10, 15, 20 years, or however long the pastor may have been there, or however long the associate minister has been at that particular congregation, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, for even those who work in the hospital setting, like, today, one of my colleagues were like, oh, I'm hosting this memorial service for my unit, uh, because last year, the VA passed away from COVID, right? Like, are you creating the space to even give yourself the ability to acknowledge and memorialize the people who did pass away, right? So we did see when Biden and Harris came into office, they did the... They set the tone. They did... uh, I don't want to say they set the tone, but... In terms of of acknowledging those who passed, is what I mean by that, like, you know. Well, when we got to 500,000, right? Yeah. Or however many people it was at the time, they did the service, and I mean... 500,000 500, people, 
you know. Yeah, by the time he by the time he got in, I think he hit, hit five hundred thousand. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's just kind of like, what are what are we to do, or how are we to go about it, mm. right? So the pandemic is one thing, right? So we can look back to um, two thousand five when Hurricane Katrina came and mm. rocked New Orleans, or yeah. I should say, just Louisiana. Right. We can look back to 9-11 when the planes came and hit in New York mm-hmm. and in Washington, D.C. Right. And wasn't there a plane in Pennsylvania? Right. Something like, like that. Yeah. So everybody's impacted. Yeah. But sometimes people try to move forward in life like this didn't just happen and mm-hmm. the world stopped. Like if, when I think back to 9-11, I was in ninth grade. Mm-hmm. in reading class and they turned on the TV and we're watching this plane, the second plane I going was to in, the Twin Tower. I was in, I don't even want to tell my age, I was in the fifth grade at the time. <laughs> yeah, I was in fifth grade. Don't laugh at me, shut up. <laughs> I, was in the, <laughs> I was in the fifth grade and I remember that like it was yesterday, Kimball Elementary School right there on, uh, right up the street from, from Sousa Middle School, Sousa Junior High School. And yeah, I rem- everybody was leaving home early, going home early. early. You know, parents coming to pick up their kids, and uh, I remember the uh, the custodian was locking the doors. He had a Joe Clock woman lock the doors. The enemy's here, you know. <laughs> and so, you know, I remember stuff like that. But and for America, we have been what's this going on? Twenty one years. America has been going through PTSD for that for the longest time, you know. Um, Longer and so, than twenty one years, we can oh, take yeah, this right. back to slavery. Yeah. Man, I think that's different though, right? Because African Americans have been going through PTSD since slavery. Yes, African Americans. Yeah, but but our Caucasian brothers and sisters, the first sign of terrorism, you know, because sometimes they they don't acknowledge the terrorism in house, you know, and they acknowledge the terrorism from the outside in before they acknowledge the terrorism that they distribute on other people, right? And so for stuff like that, we've been seeing stuff like this since, like I say, the illegal inception of this country. And and that in particular is why I wanted to have this show because I feel like African Americans, has been we've been dealing with PTSD for, for centuries, you know, since, since we were forced to come here. And so, so let me ask you this. PTSD, right? So you go through traumatic experiences. Mm-hmm. Is PTSD, I've gone through something and I have knee-jerk reactions to stuff. Like certain certain things may trigger me off and I start acting a certain kind of way. Is that really what PTSD, like what are the signs of, of PTSD? So uh, if, if, if we, how do we identify somebody that's, that's going through PTSD, if that makes sense? Yeah, yeah. So we can talk about the symptoms. Mm-hmm. Um, so what of a diagnosis of someone who has PTSD, right? Like mm-hmm. it's re-experiencing the type of symptoms, right? Mm-hmm. It's a, the reoccurring involuntary and intrusive distressing of a memory. It's the flashbacks. It's like you mm-hmm. might have a bad dream, right? It could be a particular sound that you're hearing, right? Mm-hmm. That's like a, the re-experiencing type of a symptom. Another symptom could be avoidance, right? So avoidance is can look like if you had a car accident on a particular street. You avoid going there. In that street. You avoid going down that street because you had your first car accident here, right? right? You would avoid being around certain people because maybe you got into. We could go back to high school and it was a major fight, right? And it's just like you avoid this kind of a person, or you might avoid a particular walking route because mm-hmm. you were assaulted. You, on this particular street, right? Like, yeah. um, so that's like the avoidance. And then you have cognitive and mood symptoms, right? Mm-hmm. You black it out. You have a trouble recalling the event. It might be negative thoughts about oneself. Um, you may become numb. You might guilt yourself. You might be worried. You might be depressed. Like, yeah. so, so, okay. So listen. So I'm getting ready to tell you. I'm getting ready to tell you something. You and I having a conversation. Everybody else get a chance to eavesdrop on the conversation. That's how I do my show every week. You know that. Mm-hmm. Um, so 
as you as you break that down, I've had a clear cut experience where I can say I've experienced PTSD for at least about two years when I was in high school. When I was in high school, it was the 11th grade. I was going to Archbishop Carroll High School, and I was catching the train home. It was me and two other classmates. And, you know, Carroll, you wore your, your uniform, like a, a Catholic high school. You wear your, outfit, your, you know, your, school, your school uniform, whatever. Mm -hmm. And so we were riding the train home on the red line, and I think it was some at the time it was some kids from Luke Seymour who got on the train, and we were just chilling. Like, we weren't bothering nobody. I wasn't bothering nobody. I probably looked real young. I had an afro at the time. I was a kid. I, don't laugh. Listen, I had hair. I know I'm bald now, but I had some good hair back then. I had some, some nice, good, shiny soul glow. Let your soul glow here. Right? Let your soul glow. <laughs> Just let your soul glow. <laughs> Just let it shine through. <laughs> but anyway, so we were on the train. And um, we were on the train, and a bunch of young kids, uh, I think from like Luke Seymour, that was a stop, a couple stops after I stopped, had got on, and they started picking with me. And I, was, I wasn't bothering them. I think I had just looked at them, and they, and they looked, and they were saying, you know, uh, profanity at me and all this other kind of stuff, and they got off at Gallery Place. And... It was like a good five of them, and I think one had actually got on at the stop before they got off. And all of them lined up. Now, I'm sitting down, and I'm like, I'm outnumbered anyway. And so um, I'm sitting down, and they all did like this. They said, we cool. And I'm like, I, I, two things going to happen, but one thing for sure is going to happen. They're going to do something before they get off the train. I said, now, if I try to give them that, they're going to still do something. If I don't, they're going to take offense and do something anyway. And so I lifted my hand up, and they all just bow, bow, bow. It was like five, six different fists at one time just going across my face. Train full of people at this point. Nobody did nothing. And when I tell you, I did not ride the train or public transportation for like a year. you know. And even to this day, I, it happened in the middle of the train. It happened uh, in the, you know, if you've been in D.C., people love to ride the middle of the train. I never ride the middle of the train anymore. I always go to either the very front or the very back because of that experience. And when I'm on the train to this day, I'm always very watchful. And there's always, even though things have gotten better, um, there's always this moment of me always reflecting and reliving it. And like you said, avoidance. Like I avoid riding the middle of the train. Like that's just, it just ain't happening. I'm not riding the middle of the train anymore. You know, but here's the thing though, and I want to say this, and I hope it blesses somebody. That particular day, now mind you, it was like seven or eight people at the time that had attacked me and was throwing blows. I mean, they was throwing some serious blows. And so by the time my mother was able to pick me up from the train, I went to my grandmother's house. I never forget it. I remember the, the jacket I was wearing and everything. I went to my grandmother's house and a family friend, she had some, she had two sons who happened to be there because they used to live down the street from my grandmother. And the youngest one, the youngest son, he was like five at the time. Now, watch this. I promise you this is going to bless you. He was five at the time. And so by the time I had gotten there, he had already heard what happened. And so he was looking at me and he was trying to, his five-year-old self was trying to understand and put what he heard to what he was seeing. And so by the time I got there, he was looking, he said, wait a minute. He said, D, he said, I thought you, I, I thought you got jumped on the train. I said, yeah, I did. He said, well, why I don't see no scars or bruises or blood on your face? And it didn't dawn on me. I said, while I felt the internal pain. What I went through, he couldn't see what I went through. So what I'm saying to say is, no matter what y'all going through in your lifetime, you're not going to look like what you done went through. Okay, you may feel the pain internally, and you may be going through things internally and going through changes internally. But when people see you, they're not going to see what you go through because that's just the favor and the glory and the grace that God is giving you to not look like what you've been through. Although it's traumatic, although it's been traumatizing, and although you can remember it like it's yesterday, in moments when when don't nobody really know what to understand, you wrestling in your sleep and you staying up late at night losing sleep. Understand if God can cover you externally. 
externally, he can also fix you up internally and make sure that those 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 scars and those and that pain and that trauma that you're going through internally can be dealt with as well. See, the problem with a lot of us African Americans, we love to look good externally, but we don't want to deal with the internal stuff. And if we can deal with that internal stuff, if we can deal with that pain internally, yeah, I know mama abused you, daddy abused you, they left you high and dry, but you know, you're looking good externally, you got a good job, you, you're doing well, you got money, your bank account is flowing and all this other kind of stuff, but you're still dealing with them daddy issues, you're still dealing with the mama issues and them generational curses issues and all that other kind of stuff internally and now you're wondering why your children dealing with you the way they're dealing with you is because you got all that generational mess Come and that generational now. stuff that you haven't dealt with internally, see yes, you can look good on the outside but see, you got to, and see, that's the difference between, I'm, I'm sorry Jess, I'm preaching a little bit, I'm finna get happy now, it's okay. and so and so that was see that was the difference between the old testament and the new testament in terms of the law and doing away with the law because see the the law deal with the external stuff it dealt with the stuff on the outside how you looked on the outside how you conducted yourself on the outside but see it didn't change that inner man it didn't change that spirit man see that's why jesus christ had to come on the scene because when christ came on the scene he said okay you got the law you know how to act good in public right but you ain't acting good behind closed doors when you at night wrestling with stuff and so now i'm here to give you an experience with me and that's why jesus met with the woman at the well it was a one-on-one -on -one encounter to change some stuff internally with her life and so no matter what you're going through and that's the and, and see that's a whole mic drop right there i promise you it is yeah. see that's yeah. see we should be showing off for 20 episodes just yeah. that's the yeah. that's the whole thing like you can go through stuff in life and we all go through stuff in life mm -hmm. but at the end of the day how are you dealing with that stuff how are you internalizing it? Are you wrestling with it? Because for the longest time, Jess, I'm going to tell you something. My grandmother said something to me. I love my grandmother dearly. She in her 70s. Um, and she said at the time, she said she a year had gone by and my grandfather would come every day to pick me up from school. You know, because I just refused. I would not ride the train. And she asked me something. She said, D, where is your faith? You know? And so sometimes that's easy said than done, but sometimes people got to work out certain things to work themselves back up to get mm -hmm. back to that place. And that's how some of us are. We working ourselves back up. But I mean, but go ahead, Jess. Go ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I look, listen. But no, but I'm for real though. But I'm listen, for real. Hey, this is your show. I'm just a guest. So this is... <laughs> <it. laughs> you felt the help of the Holy Ghost. I felt the okay? help. I felt, listen, li li listen. Somebody say preach Negro. I'm doing the best I can. But listen, I'm for real though. I'm I'm for real because this is why I do my show. I really want to help our people because our people we are on. As my wife would say, we be on the struggle bus. Like we, yeah. we really be struggling with some stuff, you know. And I this piece, yeah, with go the ahead. Struggle, I think even with the struggle, the struggle, right? Mm -hmm. Like I think it it always will fall back on the individual to make acknowledgments of. This is what I'm dealing with. Mm -hmm. And even if it's saying, oh, this is what I'm dealing with, because you were talking about, you know, person that's sleeping at night, you know, and my belief is, well, what's dealing with you? Mm -hmm. mm. Right. So if this is dealing with you, what are you going to do to address it? Mm. Right. How are you going to take the steps to to get the help that you need? Right. Like it's not going to go away. I think the acknowledgement of I went through this particular event in my life mm -hmm. and at some point in my life, it halted me from living a full life, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. you said it, you were avoiding the middle portion of the train because of what you experienced. Yeah. Like, I, I would not be riding the train either if that if that would have happened to me. And they were and they were pushing my mother. Now I my mother didn't push me. She didn't force me to ride the train. But other family members were like, "You need to get back on the train," you know. But but it it, it that is it took me some time. I ride I've rode the train since then. But it took me some time in my awareness when I'm on the train from that day forward is just different, you know. And and even it, it affects even when I'm like when me and my wife are out or what have you, you know, and uh, we were up in Baltimore because we were doing some investment stuff up in Baltimore. And that experience alone has affected how I function, 
you know, when I go out in different neighborhoods and stuff like that, you know, and what I do for a living, like we have to do curfew checks and we in certain neighborhoods and things of that nature. And my thing is always safety first. And I was telling my wife well, a couple of weeks ago, we were up in Baltimore. We was in, you know, you know, Baltimore got certain neighborhoods that's a little rougher than others. And I was telling my neighborhood, like, look, babe, you look more, you look too much like a tourist in this neighborhood. Get back in this car. <laughs> you know, we, you ain't finna be, you know. And so, I, and yeah, I walk around with my little pocket knives and, you know, everything that else like that. I'm a whole black man, you know what I'm saying? So it is what it is. But I mean, sometimes our experiences can shape how we function moving forward. Yeah. And I think that's very important. And so if we look at, for some of us, we don't recognize that we've gone through moments of, P that we're experiencing moments of PTSD. But if we look at our behavior, and I think those are one of the telltale signs of mm -hmm. symptoms. It's like, look at the behavior. I don't know if that's, is that true? Like behaviors are, are a category of symptoms of PTSD? Yes. Mm -hmm. So like the behavior is like either how you might be expressing yourself or how you might be holding yourself back. Right? Yeah. Are you allowing these emotions um, to process? Right? Yeah. Um, or did you just completely shut off this particular side of you? Mm -hmm. Whether you did not feel safe when this particular event happened in your life. And so mm -hmm. I think it really kind of just depends on the person, right? Like, I think if more people in the military would share about their particular experience when it pertains mm -hmm. to basic training, Mm. and then the time in in the service right mm -hmm. i think the people in the military and which i do know um i'm not going to share this person's story because right, it's right, not right, mine right. to share but i'm aware of the assaults that happen um to people who are in the military i'm aware right. how people are taken advantage of in the military and how they're bullied and even what happens when you go over to war, right? You, a bomb going off, that ain't regular. We don't live in the, we live in the right. United States. Right. People not bombing us, you know, in right. Palestine now they dealing with it. Right. Right. I just saw a video yesterday, I think it was yesterday. And it was like a, a little boy, he was like nine to 11 years old yelling for his father that just got killed. Mm. Like, what are we to do with that? How do you reconcile? You know, we can think back, you know, for us who grew up in the 90s and The Lion King came out and we talk about, oh, man, Mufasa's death. That was that so traumatic. a lot of kids. Yes. It traumatized me. Because... If we decide to look about cartoons, but we live in reality. And so every day there's something going on that is triggering, that kind of shuts a person down where they can't even function, right? So I know the reason of us even doing this particular episode was because of the Chauvin, um, the Chauvin trial and yeah, him being found guilty. And I was telling you, like, y'all was driving home on pins and needles, waiting for the verdict to come out. And I was not breathing because I'm like, man, I think something going to happen. Like, I really just, I could not really exhale because we have been going through so much. And sure as my name is Jessica, at 430 in Columbus, Ohio, a 16-year-old black teenage girl yeah. was shot four times in the chest, left in the street, mm -hmm. right? Like, no care, no attention to the body, no care, no attention to her life, like, because she had a knife in her hand. Mm -hmm. She's the one that called the police seeking help and what the laws in Ohio are is for police to protect themselves, but I mean, you signed up to protect and serve. Yeah. And I this know. young lady calls and asks for help. So for me personally, I was I remember saying like I could not exhale. Like I just could not I just believed something was going to happen. And yeah. hearing and reading about Micaiah Bryant um took a lot out of me where I was like, let me shut everything off because I have to go to bed. Like, I can't take it. I can't. Like, I can't. Because yeah. I think about, you know, the other kids that are out there. I mean, I have nephews. I have a niece. Like, I have, 
it could be anybody in our family and it sucks, right? Like I even think about the work I did as a a reentry counselor um, for a federal um, halfway house and getting to hear these stories of men and women who were returning to society, um, curious about how did you get there, but okay, but how did you survive in there? You know, did something happen to you? Um, How are you able to even live? Like there was one of the guys on my caseload. He went in when I was born. And I was in 87. He came out, so it was in 2017, 2018. He, He wasn't out when ATM machines were created. He wasn't out here when smartphones. He was in prison. And he was struggling with trying to adjust to society. He was trying to adjust to not having to respond to someone telling him to wake up and eat and go to work, right? Those things play a lot in a person's mental um, well-being, mental and emotional well-being. Yeah. So, so you said so you talked about a lot, and so you talked about um, Makaya Bryant the day that we experience the Derek Chauvin verdict, right? Mm-hmm. When I so, so the interesting thing about the Derek Chauvin trial is we got to see almost a thousand times the interaction with George Floyd, with Derek Chauvin and all the other officers that were there on May 25th, whenever that happened. I think it was May 25th, right? Mm-hmm. And so one of the things initially, like in the beginning of a lot of those videos, you could hear George Floyd saying, "He's one, he's been shot before. Two, he's had an encounter with law enforcement before and it didn't go well. And three, he was suggesting and hinting and trying to express to them he's scared because of past experiences. And so a lot of his behavior, him being claustrophobic, is a result probably because of what happened to him before. You know, him... Tr- like panicking, having anxiety, heart le- levels going up the wazoo is because of post-traumatic stress because each and every time you deal with law enforcement, sometimes you think about that last encounter that may not have went so well. Mm-hmm. And so I think about that, like it, you wonder why he's responding. And see, I struggle when our white counterparts don't understand that because in reality, they don't have to worry about getting pulled over by law enforcement and have to wonder if they're going to make it home at night because of the color of their skin. Like That's almost like in the back of their mind. Us African-Americans, on the other hand, we go through encounters with law enforcement and we have to wonder if the if, if this, this encounter is... <laughs> which is probably for something crazy anyway, are we going to make it home at night? Is this going to be a tragic end that we didn't see coming? Right? Mm -hmm. You know, and so those are, and sometimes, so is there, let me ask you this, because is there a such thing as uh, secondary post-traumatic stress, right? Because, you know, like how you got secondhand smoke, is there Mm -hmm. a such thing as secondary post-traumatic stress to where you were not directly affected with something indirectly happened to where it now has caused you to be in a state of post-traumatic stress. Because for me, I've never had a bad, to my knowledge, I've never had a bad encounter with law enforcement. However, seeing my fellow brothers and sisters have experiences to where they've been beaten, murdered, and, and dealt with unjustly makes me scared. And so it makes me nervous and gives me a moments of anxiety when I'm dealing with law enforcement, even though, you know, I ain't got no record or nothing like that. But is there such thing as post secondary post traumatic stress disorder? I mean any any event that causes you to like go into a particular state is considered traumatic. Right. Yeah. I mean it just happens. You're re triggered, you know, um like I know I shared about domestic violence and we both shared about an experience and how it was your body goes into a shock. Like Mm -hmm. what, what is happening right now? What am I supposed to do? You know? And sometimes you're literally just standing there or sitting Mm -hmm. or crying because you don't know what to do or you don't know how to move forward. Um, I think the 
an unhealthy way about how people cope with um, PTSD. Of course, uh, the unhealthy coping mechanisms are people will either overwork themselves or push themselves into work and people will um, use substances, alcohol, drugs to pretend Right. Like you, my air quotes, pretend like nothing happened. Right. And something did happen. And, but then there's also that side of maybe they don't know how to talk about it. Maybe they don't know how to express what they just experienced. But if we begin to pay attention to how we're functioning to these particular events mm-hmm. and getting the help that's out there, that's the only way we're going to get through, not get mm-hmm. over, but get through. Because it's a process of doing the work to addressing and acknowledging and finding healthy coping mechanisms, right? Yeah. Like, I'll make sure I'm not saying too much so we can catch up, but that's just, just no, no. what it is. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. So, so go ahead. I don't know if you've seen it. Go ahead. Now it's going to wait till you ask the questions. Oh, <laughs> so... Talking. So, I'm trying to think. Okay, so 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 well, maybe I ask that last. So, I wrote a book some years ago because I had a really bad addiction to pornography from age 13 to about 23. Um, so that's a whole 10 year time span that I've had an addiction, and I was exposed to it by my mother's one of my mother's ex-boyfriends and one of the things i can remember um when i was you know trying to walk in my deliverance and come out of it it was hard because you had mentioned something about the symptoms about flashbacks Mm -hmm. right and when i was trying to uh get clean of my addiction, you know, and and get away from it and walk in my deliverance, it was mm-hmm. hard because of the flashbacks of the images that I saw. And the images that I saw was like tattoos on the minds. I wrote about it in my book. It's like a tattoo on the mind. It's hard to erase. And so moments like, it, it, when I tell you my addiction was bad, it was so bad to where, you know, I'm doing something productive, and the images will pop up and and now I'm finding myself going through changes externally, like just fighting, pacing and, and trying to just deal with myself, like it, it talk to myself and minister to myself. And I'm like, so is that PTSD, like dealing with addictions, you know, uh, being exposed to stuff? And is that is that considered PTSD too? Yeah, so okay. it's a form of like molestation in a sense. You were exposed Whoa. to something sexually. Oh man. Right? I, wow. So like for me, I don't mind sharing this because this is my story. I'm the yeah. one living through it, you know. I was um sexually assaulted at sixteen. Mm-hmm. Um and I'm like I'm how old I am now. Um, and Don't tell your I... age. <laughs> <laughs> I know your age. Yeah, yeah. Don't tell your age. No, no, I'm and messing with so, you. And so I remember back in 2019, I had a flashback and I oh, legit had an episode Ooh. where I cried the whole next day. I was triggered watching a Grey's Anatomy episode that caused me to, like, I was like, oh, this is too much. I shut it off. I oh, went man. to sleep. And then I woke up from dreaming about what happened to me when I was 16. And I'm just like, what in the entire world is going on that it took into the next day where I cried still struggling and all listening. day. And I was like, man, I think like I need to, like I knew I had a therapy session the following week, but I'm just like, what, like, what do I need to do? Like, you know, how, how am I going to get out of this? Um, mm-hmm. So I, I went through the day and I just allowed myself to cry. But when I went to my therapy session and I told my therapist what I had experienced, she had me sit in it. Sit and in it. Sit in it. And when I mean sit in it, it we sat, like... in the t- yeah, sat in the tears, 
sat in okay. the anger, sat in the frustration because something was taken from me. And so my acknowledgement of what was taken from me, um, I'm now taking my power back. I am now using my voice to speak to what I experienced, right? Yeah. Um, the flashback, <laughs> yo, it, it's so crazy to have the flashbacks. It's so crazy to think that all the like the people that you may encounter are out to harm you or going to violate you because of what you have been through. And if I did not begin to deal with what I had been through, I would not be in the space that I am in today. Right? My my goal <laughs> is for me to be happy, healthy and whole, right? Yes to do the work that God has called me to do. But then also there are people I'm going to meet along this life's journey that's going to need that healed portion of Jessica, mm -hmm. right? So if I'm able to do my own work, which I am doing my own work, I'm very committed to doing this work. Yeah. Listen, I could not, I could not be here where I am having this conversation with you just sharing yeah. what I went through at 16 because of a flashback. Yeah. That doesn't mean the flashbacks don't, they still happen. Yeah, they do. And they it's do. legit just like, let me have this conversation with my therapist about it because am I going to have to deal with these flashbacks for the rest of my life? And so and so, what did your therapist say? Because I'm pretty sure you asked that question. So did the therapist say I'm yes? I'm trying or? to see, did I, did I ask that question? I don't remember. Oh, but, well, let me question. ask you then. Well, let me ask you then. Um, do, do, do those, is it likely that that happens for the rest of your life? Like, is I mean... And it could be a yes or no answer. I don't think it's a right or wrong. I think answer. so. I think so. I mean, you're going to experience some similar things in life, um, mm -hmm. and it may not be as traumatic, and it may not be as painful. Um, yeah. But the the thought is still there. You know, um, I really think it's just how we address it and acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. um, I know that person is not going to harm me. That person don't even know where they're at in this world anymore. You know, they don't know where I'm at in my life and in my world, you know, and um, my current therapist asked me when I mm -hmm. shared this a couple weeks ago, he asked, he said, and do you believe God was with you when you went through that? Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, I believe God was with me. I won't, I won't ever say I believe God caused that to happen to me. Yeah. I do believe God was with me. Um, and I'll I'll put the like this one, the the violator, there's something wrong with that person. Yeah. Right? So for you in your situation with the guy who exposed you to pornography, like, yo, there's something wrong with him, right? Yeah. He he was dead wrong to expose you to pornography at 13. And yeah. then you legit lived with this particular addiction for 10 years. Mm -hmm. and, and the interesting thing is, so this is how you know there was a call of my life, right? That happened the same year that I gave my life to Christ. The very same year. And so I didn't even get a chance <laughs> to get a head start in my walk with God because the very same year I gave my life to Christ was the very same year I was exposed. And so um, I know some people are, are like, oh, I didn't know that happened to Carol. I wrote a whole book about it. Go on Amazon, get it. Say sanctified, addicted to porn, overcome sexual perversion. I tell, I'm very specific and graphic in terms of that particular moment when I was exposed. Uh, instant plug. You like that, don't you? I know you like that. A plug for my own book. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, but you know, and, and so yeah, and so 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 okay so i'm asking you this so mm -hmm. based upon what i said how i was exposed you you would say based upon your professional opinion i was actually molested i'm not gonna say you were molested but i think you were definitely taken advantage of i think okay. there was something because i know that, you said that earlier like that, that was i think like it's a like form, a, a form, a form I, th I think wow i think so Dang. right like, you know, yeah go ahead i don't I think for me, for how I look at things or how things are brought to me, this is my perspective perspective on it. Yeah. Um, I think you were definitely violated, right? Yeah. And then you have to ask yourself and answer for yourself, what were the impacts? 
I was messed up for years after that. Like I was, I was messed up for years. Right. And so when you say you're, you were messed up for years. Like I found myself, when I say messed up for years, I found myself heavily addicted. Like it, so sometimes, you know, and I'm not ashamed to talk about this, you know, because honestly, a lot of y'all kids doing the same thing. They've been at home quarantine and they got all these electronics and all it takes is a millisecond to be exposed to some pornographic stuff. So yeah, a lot of y'all got nephews and kids that's going through some of this stuff. So let me help you. Right. And so, yeah, I was messed up because I could not get away from it. It got to a point to where I had to go through that six times a day. Like that was just the minimum. And I and, and so on top of that, I was dealing with low self-esteem issues. I didn't think I was attractive. I thought I was the ugliest person walking, you know what I'm saying? And so moments like that, I was using, while I was exposed, mm -hmm. they were also simultaneously coping mechanisms I was using to deal with some other stuff that was going on with me internally. And so when you have all of those variables together, it's a dangerous combination. And it was dangerous for me because it got to a point in my adulthood I took that stuff into my adulthood, you know, and I was married before and I took that stuff into my previous marriage, right? You know, and on top of stuff that was going on in my previous marriage, once again, using that as a coping mechanism. And mm -hmm. so when I got to a point to where I was like, I was just tired, you know, it was no longer me just needing it because I needed to have it. It became a part of my routine. It became just like um, something just, just to do at a spirit of moment. And I saw how unhealthy it was the guilt and, and all that stuff that I wrestled with going through, you know, dealing with that whole thing. It, it, it just was a lot. I was called to preach, you know, and trying to, and, and, and men of the cloth, our biggest issue a lot of times is our flesh. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to say, so, this, is my, this is my show. I'm going to say what I want to say, right? You can say it. And so uh, part of the, the, the problem that we have is, you know, controlling that flesh. And so, I mean, for me personally, it, it just, it was weighing so heavy on me. It mm -hmm. was weighing so heavy on me. And so I was just in a space to where I was trying to, Lord, how do I come out of this? You know, that's, that's, that's just where I was. Yeah. So uh, let me ask you this question. How mm -hmm. did you come out of it? Right. What, what did you do to come out of it? So, so one of the things I talk about it in my book. Um, so one of the things in my last marriage, my one of my stepsons at the time, the same age he had got exposed to it, not because he got material from me, but because he was shown some stuff from school. And so I was raising him and I was like, yo, I owe it to him. Like, I can't talk to him if I'm not walking in it myself. And so that moment was like a wake up call for me. Like, and so when I was transparent with him about the stuff I had gone through, he looked at me, he was like, what? You know, you've been through the same thing too? You know, and so for me, it was like, I just got serious about it. Like, I just got tired. You know, I felt like I was living a lie. I felt like while I was preaching and doing different things internally behind closed doors, I had this struggle that nobody knew about, you know. And so I had a conversation with myself, like, I'm done. Like, I can't keep doing this anymore you know and i had to change my behaviors i had to i had to do different things like know what my triggers were right and so what things would get me started and so for me it's like i can't watch certain videos i can't watch certain movies like i can't certain conversations you know that you know and so back then it was like yo if i see a nice looking female i can't look at them too long i can't look at pictures and stuff like that like i have to know what my triggers are be aware of them stay away you know, and uh, really, and so for me, I think the disservice that sometimes we do in the body of Christ is when we talk about deliverance, we talk about getting to that moment of deliverance, but we don't talk about maintaining your deliverance, right? And so mm -hmm. maintaining your deliverance is like in getting an oil change, right? You can have a Maserati, a Tesla or whatever, but if you don't get those regular oil changes, that car going to run into the ground, and so for me, it was like, while I'm delivered, if I don't get regular oil changes spiritually, if I don't fast regularly, 
if I don't check myself and hold myself accountable and even allow other people to check in on me and hold me accountable, right, I'm going to run myself into the ground spiritually because nobody is holding me accountable. And so for me, it was like knowing what my triggers were. That was the biggest thing, knowing my triggers, holding myself accountable, allowing other people to hold me accountable, being transparent, right, and then not being afraid to talk about what I was wrestling with. <clears throat> and then documentation, because I documented my journey along the way, you know, like, and so before I know it, because I keep a journal, so it was like, this is week one clean, this is week two clean, you know, and before I know it, I had gotten like the year five, and you know, and I was like, wow, I'm just going for it, you know, and so for me, it was the progress that continued to encourage me, and so now it's like, you can't even pay me, like, to, to, to get into that, because the progress and all that work the last thing I want to do is to see all that work go down the drain. That's the, the last thing, you know, that I want to do. So, you know. Okay, something happened. I, I went away. Are uh, you back now? I see you okay. back now. Okay. I see you back now. Okay. You back now. Okay. Um. So the last thing I heard was the deliverance and yeah. like the oil changes and the spiritual maintenance that we have to take mm -hmm. um to see really are we delivered but the yeah. challenge that i'm about to bring into this entire into that particular portion of this conversation is therapy right mm -hmm. did you put yourself in therapy to help you navigate with healthy coping mechanisms mm -hmm. and you know we we can talk about you know i prayed and I sought the Lord about it, and but did you did you go and seek no. professional help? No, I didn't go to, to really therapy. Deal with this particular addiction. Yeah, no, I didn't go to therapy. Um, and so at the time, therapy was and honestly, therapy was nowhere on my radar. Like that's just I didn't know anybody that was going mm -hmm. to therapy. I didn't know how to get connected with therapy. I didn't know none of that. I didn't go to therapy until after I was divorced. And so a lot of stuff, like, I, and, and my wife would tell you, there was like a lot of stuff about my behavior, you know, like what we talked about, flashbacks, knee-jerk reactions, certain stuff reminded me of certain experiences. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, why am I responding this way? Why am I doing this? Like, this is not cool. Like, why am I lashing out or in this particular way? Or why am I acting like this? Or why am I responding this way? And so, no, in that moment when I was, no, I didn't go to therapy. I didn't go to therapy to, to therapy until years later. You know, I didn't go, and and that's when all that stuff came out, and I started to unpack it. You know, and 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 deal with it. And so, and and I would say I'm a I'm an advocate for therapy, counseling, whatever. Go because a lot of times you you tend to unpack stuff from childhood, and you tend to unpack stuff. Mm -hmm. from years that you have suppressed and swept under the rug and a lot of times we sweep stuff under the rug unintentionally or really like not even aware that that's what we're doing but we call ourselves progressing you know and going forward but you i i believe like you need those moments of therapy of counseling you know it's not always about you being crazy and, and because you're going mm -hmm. to a therapist man forget what people say listen you need to make sure that your mental state is 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 good so you can function not just for yourself, but for your spouse, for your kids, for the people around you that you serve and that you work with. You know, like that's that's just a, a big thing for me. Like, hey, go to therapy. And so, you know, my my wife, she's a college and career counselor, so she's a counselor, you know. And so, yeah, my wife is always my counselor. I'd be like, look, I'm not okay today. <laughs> like, that's what I'm telling her. I ain't okay today. Like, she'd be like, you good? And I'm just, and, and, and one thing I've noticed is I'm in the space now where if something ain't right, I'm going to let you know it ain't right. Like, it's been times where I've told her I'm not having yeah. a good day. No, I'm not okay. The same today, I'm just not feeling 100%. Mm -hmm. I'm mad right now. I don't feel like talking about mm -hmm. it, but I will. And so she'll give me that space to, you know, deal with my emotions and get to a place to where I can communicate effectively. And I think even with stuff, traumatic stuff that we've gone through, it's affected our communicate our ability to communicate. And so sometimes people think we just crazy. It's not that we're crazy or it's not that you're crazy. It's the fact that because of what you've gone through, it's affected your way of communicating. Because sometimes, like, for example, a child that may have been molested, you know, their communication in the future as they get older, dealing with the opposite sex or what have you, 
their communication is bad because of what happens a lot of mm-hmm. times. So, I mean, and so sometimes you think people are being mean-spirited or they just, you just so, what they say on, um, what did Marcus say on Why Did I Get Married? You just so evil. You know, it's sometimes people evil. Just ain't evil. Sometimes people just ain't evil. It's just that things have happened to them. And, and mm-hmm. us African-Americans, we have to be patient with our people. We got to be patient with our people. Yeah. And we have to be in the place to where we're willing to help people unpack a lot of things if they're willing to get help. And that's what I want to ask. So it's two questions I want to ask you, right, leading into that. So what are what are ways for us to cope or coping mechanisms with PTSD? And then the second part to that is what do you do when you come across somebody that you're aware they're dealing with PTSD, but they don't want help? Like, so those are two questions. I think for let me answer the second one first. For a person that doesn't want to get help, mm-hmm. um, you can't force them. Yeah, like don't belittle them, don't berate them, because they they're not ready to address what they've been through. Mm-hmm. It might be it really might be just too much for them, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and the first question was how? What was it again? Oh gosh, what was the first question? The first question. Oh, coping mechanisms. So coping mechanisms, I think you you get those when you're in therapy, right? So I think it really so just depends on what absolutely. I think it really just depends on what your traumatic event was mm-hmm. or your traumatic incident was. Um, and if you're open and willing to really start addressing mm-hmm. what happened. Right. I think a way to get over, like if you've had a, a, a bad car accident, and I've been in three car accidents. Um, Lord have mercy. Right. The one that really just kind of jacked me up the most was being rear ended by a 15 passenger van. And it's just like, I'm always now looking in the rear view mirror, especially if it's like. That's a sermon. Go ahead, Ray, preach it. I'm a. I'm going to toss it to you. You better preach it. To, I swear to God. I swear to God you better preach it. Talk about that rearview mirror. <laughs> so I'm constantly looking in the rearview mm. mirror if a 15 passenger van is behind me. Um, if I would continue to look in the rear view, I would get stuck. And yes. I don't want to get stuck there. Right? So it's just like really just trusting in myself as the driver, making sure that I'm like, okay, Mm-hmm. Is there enough space? Like, you know, it is it is uncomfortable having to be on the edge, right? It's yes. it's uncomfortable when we still just live in this life and in this world of the unexpected. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you've been through a traumatic incident, it really does alter your mental and emotional. Sometimes it alters your physical health and well-being. And so for coping mechanisms, I mean, it's up to the, the therapist and the individual to figure out what works best for them. I want to add something to that rearview mirror part, right? Mm-hmm. You talked about that you constantly look in the rearview mirror. So there's a lot of things you can take from that. Looking in the rearview mirror, you're focused on what's behind you. One, you're focused on that same experiences. You're kind of forcing yourself to look at those flashbacks in some Mm -hmm. ways, right? To keep looking backwards. But then if you stay focused too long, you're missing what's in front of you. Mm -hmm. And one or two things can happen. You can miss your turn. Ooh, that's a sermon. You can miss your turn. Or two, you can end up doing the same thing to somebody else and re-earning somebody else because you too yeah. focused on. And so, in other words, what that means is hurt people hurt people, right? Yeah. And so, and, and so, think about understand this when you're dealing with your when you're dealing with situations um, that are traumatizing and you're dealing with post traumatic stress. If you don't deal with that stuff, you can go out here and hurt somebody else. Not because you have a goal to hurt somebody else, but because you didn't deal with your own stuff. You didn't deal with your own, you know, 
trauma or what have you. Now you're bleeding on other people and now you're hurting other people and now you're causing the same pain that was done to you to other people. Some of the best actors in the world are not in Hollywood. Some of the best actors in the world are not uh, hooked up with New Line Cinema and Tyler Perry Studios. Some of the best actors are those that have been hurt because a lot of times what they do is portray to you and demonstrate to you what has been done to them. And so a lot of times when you look at people and their crazy behaviors, understand if you if you really in tune with God and you really in tune with, you know, or what have you, uh, got a relationship, understand that these people a lot of times are not just out here to be mean spirited and to be crazy and to do you harm but a lot of times mm -hmm. folks have been hurt and they mm -hmm. have had nobody to show them the way to how to deal with their stuff properly they have not been given any coping mechanism skills they have not been given any tools or any resources to be able to deal with the stuff that has been done to them or how they have been treated and so now it's it's our responsibility as a people each one teach one right not only each one teach one but if you are a professional in whatever it is you do if you if you know better come on we can do better as the people and so when you see people out here going through changes and wrestling with stuff it's it's our responsibility because listen white america ain't gonna do it right we we already fighting a whole battle in and of itself with that thing and so we have a responsibility to make sure our community is taken care of our community is straight and so while we're on this plight of trying to get justice right you know racial justice and in discrimination and prejudice and all this other kind of stuff we have to make sure that our mental state is in check we got to make sure that the stuff that we've experienced we've dealt with that and so when we're before white supremacy and we're before powers that be that we're trying to uh advocate for our rights and legislation right we're not just talking out of the side of our neck because we haven't dealt with a lot of pain and a lot of times when you talk out the side of your neck it's because you still dealing with all that raw pain and all those raw emotions and all that raw stuff are they you, dealing with it or is it dealing with them what you said what you said is dealing with them right and so and so we have to be able to deal with that we got to be able to check that because otherwise, how are we going to progress if we don't if we don't deal with that stuff? And so, mm -hmm. like I said, this is why I do my show. I love coming online. I love making my stuff look fancy. But at the end of the day, right, I always say anytime I preach, Rev, and I'm going to end it with this. Anytime I preach, I always ask God, don't let this sermon be a good sermon, but a sermon that's going to do the people some good. And so mm -hmm. don't let this podcast just be a good podcast, but a podcast that can do the people some good. Yes. And amen. Amen. Last words, Jess, you got before we ended up off the show. Last words. Be able to go out and do the work that you need so that you can be happy, healthy, and whole and free. I love you, Jess. I'm giving you love an air hug. Too. I, listen, <laughs> uh, so me and Jess already talked about it. She coming back. <laughs> she coming back. Um We've talked, to, and so, and honestly, just this is what I think. I believe that the Lord is really dealing with me about the mental state of our people, you know, mm -hmm. the body of Christ and African Americans in general, and mm -hmm. just people in general, right? And so, um, when you come back, we're gonna talk about grief counseling or, or grief dealing with grief, grief and, and loss. loss. Yeah, grief and loss, um, because like we said, we, you know, people have lost a lot this last fourteen months, and just life in general. A lot of people have lost a lot in they're still stuck. Some people can't move on and, and function in the place of wholeness and happiness because they're dealing with grief or not. Or, or like you said, they might not be dealing with grief, but grief might be dealing with them. The just mm -hmm. commit side eye. Right. <laughs> but grief might be dealing with them. So, I mean, you know, uh, we, we going to get our mental state together and we're going to put these videos out there so that uh, people can always go back and look at them. And so y'all do me a favor like share and subscribe to the podcast like share and subscribe to the podcast here uh and subscribe to the podcast because listen uh we trying to do some some wonderful things here and listen if you like what we're doing if you like the podcast um you can give you can give through zale at deontay j curl at gmail.com also cash app at dollar sign dj curl 91 drop something in there it takes money to run this show and do this stuff and so if you want to be a blessing hey whatever i don't I, I'm not one of them people in them preachers. I see a hundred dollar line here, hundred dollar, five fifty dollar line there. Listen, if you want to give, it, hey, here's here's ways that you can give. All right. Also follow me at uh, Twitter at Deontay J Carroll. No apostrophe, no space. 
Also follow me on Facebook Live because every week I go live on Facebook at Deontay J. Carroll Sr. Also, you want to follow me on YouTube at Deontay Carroll, no apostrophe, all right, because I post all of my episodes, everything from my podcast on YouTube to where you can always go back and also follow me on Instagram at Deontay Carroll. And listen, I want to thank my special, 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 special guest, Rev. Jessica Mitchum. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. And so, so that's it. We have reached the end of season one of Turn Up the Volume. All right, we coming back with season two. Oh, uh, so next week, y'all. Next week, got a very special guest, the one and only Stacy Lattisall Jackson, the evangelist Stacy Lattisall Jackson. Uh, you may have heard of her. She was a R and B singer. She sung. Did duets with Johnny Gill. Uh, she was very, very young in the music industry um, when she recorded her first album, I believe at age 12. And she left the industry at a very young age to, uh, to continue to follow her faith in Jesus Christ. And she became a preacher, evangelist. Uh, so she's going to be with us. I call her Aunt Stacy, right? <laughs> As that, that, that's my other auntie from afar. Um, her, her and my mom and all of them, we've been in the same neighborhood. But she's going to be on with us next week. We're going to be talking about from faith to fame. And so uh, we got some other stuff lined up as we go into season two. Well, like I said, y'all, be easy. Do me a favor. Uh, be blessed. I love you guys. Just stay on for a second. Don't go nowhere. Uh, but do me a favor. Call somebody up, tell them you love them, check on them. Like, I know we're coming out of this pandemic, but do me a favor, check on your people, okay? And if you don't have anybody, to, you know, to check on, listen, share this information. If you're going through any kind of situation, traumatic situations, PTSD, I know Jess is smiling because she was making sure I had this stuff uh, <laughs> before I went on this show. All right. Uh, but there's a couple of hotlines that you can reach out to. Disaster Distress Helpline, 800-985-5990. National Child Abuse Hotline, 800-422-4453. And you also have the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. That's 1-800-273-8255. And there's a bunch of other numbers and other hotlines that you can uh, reach out to. But those are just a few to start you guys out with that I found that I came across. And uh, like I said, once again, we want to thank the good Reverend Jessica Mitchum for coming on yet again, being one of the most favorite guests on the show because she got a whole fan club out here in these uh, podcast streets. All right. All right. So make sure y'all go follow her at underscore that. So Jess also follow her at uh, Jessica Mitchum on Facebook. And like I said, I love you guys. Be safe. Be good. I'm Deontay Curl. We turn the volume and do me a favor until next time. Keep that volume turned up. Be blessed. Love y'all.